We are in John 7. We're going to look at verses 25 through 36 today. We'll call this from Nazareth and the Father, because that's where Jesus is explaining today. He's coming from both. They won't understand it. They're questioning him on all these things. Last Sunday, we looked at John 7 earlier, and he had said, stop judging by appearances and judge with right judgment. He's going to go back to that. Y'all judge with right judgment. So certainly, he's speaking to people that have not yet believed in him, but there are also strong applications here for believers. Do we ever um, do things with wrong judgment? Yes, we do. And if you think, you know, I can't remember a time where I did that, woe to you, because um, we are all prone to make mistakes, to wander, to sin. And if you go, I just can't remember a time where I've really messed up in the past, you are in high um, waters and you don't even know it. So there is certainly applications here for believer and unbeliever today. We're gonna see where's the Messiah from? And he's gonna go down this road of, I come from Nazareth and the Father, and they're not gonna get that. And they, we end today with a question. Uh, and then we're gonna continue on. With actually, actually, Adam will be preaching in a couple of weeks, and he'll finish out John 7 for us. I'm looking forward to that. Chapter 7, verse 25 through 27. This is the word of God. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking boldly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? So as compared to the Jewish pilgrims that were visiting to Jerusalem for the feast. These here are the locals of Jerusalem. There are the Jerusalemites. And they are fully aware that the authorities want to kill Christ. And so it's really helpful to see this overlaid in the book of John, chapter 7, that there's really three groups of quote unquote Jews. And you need to make sure and understand which group is speaking. Uh, the first one, We'll see, these were the Jewish leaders who wanted to kill Christ. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Feast of Booths have come, and they say in verse 11, where is he? Now, they're not gonna arrest him, as we'll see, but they wanna make sure and keep an eye on him. That's the uh, Jews, the Jewish leaders. The second group that we'll see in verse 20, these are the Jewish pilgrims not from Jerusalem. So when Jesus says, you're trying to kill me, these Jews are saying, you have a demon. You're crazy. What are you talking about? There's another group. They don't know anything about these um, uh, leaders killing him, wanting to kill Christ. And then finally, the Jerusalemites. And that's really where the focus is on today. Uh, they're fully aware of the plots of the enemies of Christ. And therefore, they'll say in verse 25, is this not the man they seek to kill? And look, he's speaking. He's speaking openly. And continuing on, they say, they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? Now look up here. Don't you hate it when a speaker forces you? Look up here. Look up. You don't have to, I guess. Um, when he says the Christ, you need to remember um, the name Christ is not Jesus' last name. I mean, really, there's adults that have grown up in the Christian faith and they don't fully realize that. Christ is a Greek word, Christos, it means Messiah. There's a Jewish word for Messiah, and it sounds actually a little bit like our English derivative, Messiah. So when you see the Christ or the Messiah, it's the same term, exact same term. So the authorities here we see are no longer attacking him, and they're wondering, these Jerusalemites are going, have they, have thou, they now accepted him as the Christ, as the Messiah? And we find out, no. Uh, why aren't the authorities arresting him then? Why are they letting him teach? Well, something you should not forget whenever you read the Gospels, a couple of things. Number one, the authorities hate Jesus. Why do they hate him primarily? They're jealous of him. You see that over and over in the text, but they're, they hate him, to be clear. Um, secondly, you should remember the reason why they don't arrest him or they don't seek to kill him is they also fear the people. 
They're scared. They don't want a riot on their hands. And so that's always kind of holding them back from arresting Christ. They're like, we hate him, we're jealous of him, but we fear the people, so let's wait. Uh, and so the, what the Jerusalemites at this point say, wait, we know where this man comes from. And of course, to the average Jew, they would say he's from Nazareth. Why don't they look further? Do you ever wonder why don't the Jerusalemites just come to Christ and go, hey, but where were you born? Because we know Micah 5, 2, the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Where were you born? Why don't they ask him? And I would put this proposal forth, they don't want to know the answer. It's not that they can't, it's they don't want to. 2 Peter 3, 5 lines out these scoffers that don't actually want to know the answers about who Jesus Christ really is. The same sort of folks that we seek to witness to here in America. It says, it says in 2 Peter 3, 5, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following after their own sinful desires. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. What's he saying? They deny the flood. They propose evolution as an answer for how the earth was created. It says, for they deliberately, important term, they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. They don't want to know. And J.C. Ryle, who I quote often, 19th century uh, pastor, he says that they are willingly ignorant. Listen to this quote. They shut their eyes against the plainest facts and doctrines of Christianity. They pretend to say they do not understand and cannot therefore believe the things that we press on their attention as needful to salvation. But alas, in 19 cases out of 20, it is willful ignorance. They do not believe what they do not like to believe. Now, this is a bit nuanced here. The Bible's very clear. You can't understand the things of Christ because they are spiritually given. But there's another side of this. The reason why people don't want to come to Christ, the reason why they don't come to Christ is they don't want to. This process of, of election, which we've been talking about, uh, some people, they go, I don't, I don't like the idea of that, that God doesn't call everyone. But we should remember, once again, the reason why people don't come to Christ, they don't want to come to Christ. They have no desire to come to Christ. As a matter of fact, oftentimes when I will witness to people, and I don't do it as often as I should, but uh, when I seek to um, be witnesses and make disciples, and I'll talk to people, I'll give them the gospel, and oftentimes, most of the time, they don't want to believe. They don't want to trust in Christ. I think I've made it clear. I pray I've made it clear. But what I will often end with, and many of you do this, is I'll say, do you have a Bible at home? And oftentimes they will say yes. Uh, and I will say, listen, my encouragement, if you really want to know if what I'm telling you is the truth, then read for yourself one of the gospels. Perhaps Luke or John in particular might be most helpful. The others are good as well. And Rarely, if ever, have I gotten anybody to say, you know, I'll do that. That's a great idea. I've never really studied the claims of Christ. Instead, what they'll often say, I've read the Bible. Have you gotten that before? The number of people out there that have actually read the entire Bible is astounding to me. I think they're lying. John Haywood, British writer of 1546, puts it this way. There are none so blind as those who will not see. Listen, folks, these people are not interested in finding out if Jesus really is the Messiah. They won't stomach the idea that this man sitting in front of them could be the Messiah. So they're not gonna check it out any further. And when you talk to your unbelieving friends or enemies about Jesus Christ, you need to know that. Darkness hates light. They don't want anything to do with it. So they say something else about Christ. And when the Christ appears in verse 27, no one will know where he comes from, which is not exactly true. Micah 5 verse 2 
makes it very clear that Christ is born in Bethlehem. That's how the chief priests and the scribes answered the wise men of Matthew 2. So they obviously knew where Christ was going to be born. And I'd like to introduce to you three facts, three facts the Jerusalemites think they know about the Christ or the Messiah. I mean, they are certain this is it. They know that, number one, that Jesus is from Nazareth, but presently lives in Capernaum. They know that. And then you go, wait a second. Once again, you're not asking him, what about Bethlehem? Where, where are you from? Where were you born? Oh, Bethlehem? Well, maybe this guy could be one of them. No, they're not answering that. They're not interested. Something else they think they know, number two, number two they will know for certain when the Messiah comes. They will recognize him, 100%. One of the reasons why they believe they will recognize him is they're awaiting, according to the book of Malachi, they're waiting on the arrival of who? Elijah. Malachi says, before the great and terrible day of the Lord occurs, I will send my prophet Elijah, who will introduce the Messiah. And who was that person of Elijah? John the Baptist. Now, we don't think he's the same person, I'm not saying that, but he came into the spirit and power of Elijah. And what did they do with him? Now, we don't, we don't recognize him either. So they're 0 for 2. Number three, they think they know that no one will know where the Messiah comes from. He just will show up. Now, it's interesting because they have some credence for believing that third point. They're wrong, but they have some credence for it. And the reason why, as you see in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, that Malachi will say, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. He will just show up. And it's interesting because we've studied this, have we not? In John chapter two, where Jesus shows up at the temple and he cleans out the temple. And so these people took this too far and they said, no one will know where he comes from. He will just like, oh, there he is. (sighs) Well, the Talmud, I discussed last week, the Talmud is the oral interpretations of scripture. Some of it was right, much of it was wrong. The Talmud taught that the origin of the Messiah would be a mystery. He would just walk in and people would go, who is this? I don't know, but he's the Messiah and we all know it. No, no. Trypho the Jew, as a matter of fact, in the second century, 120 years after Jesus Christ walked the earth, the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah, which they're still waiting to this day. What he wrote is he said, Christ the Messiah, if he has indeed been born and exists anywhere, he's unknown and does not even know himself and has no power until Elijah comes to anoint him and make him manifest to all. You see how messed up they were in their thinking? Christian, beware, lest you think that somehow you're not messed up in some of your thinking. I digress, we'll come back to that. Verse 28 and 29. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. I know him for I have come from him and he sent me. Now when it says in verse uh, twenty eight that Jesus proclaimed. It's this Greek word kratzo. It's supposed to sound like a like a calling of a call, call, you know that sound. That's what it's supposed to sound like. Kratzo, it means he cried out. Uh, it's used, that term is always used by John for a public statement. You can imagine he's probably speaking with some emotion here. So he's been teaching in the temple and now he's crying out something. What is exactly is he crying out? He says, you know me and you know where I come from. Now, this saying of Christ can be taken in one of three ways. In some sense, I apologize to y'all for always giving you three ways and two ways, but I wanna give you the whole gist of scripture to teach the whole counsel of God. In some areas, I just don't know for certain. Many areas, I don't know. And so you can imagine or maybe you can consider which one is accurate 
uh, number one, he's saying, this, he's saying this by statement of fact. He's saying to them in a loud voice, you know me and you know where I come from. Statement of fact, declarative. But I don't think that's actually right because that gives his opponents too much credit. It's like he's saying, y'all know I'm from Nazareth and you know Joseph and Mary are my parents. He doesn't say that. I don't think he's saying it declaratively. Well, what other way could he be saying it? Well, in the Koine Greek, there are no punctuation marks, none. So you have to just figure out from the text, is it a question? Is it not a question? So he could have said it like this. You know me and you know where I came from? That could be done as a way to challenge them, perhaps. I'm really along the lines that I think the third one is accurate. I think he's using some sarcasm, some biting sarcasm here. So we would say something like this. So you know me, you know where I come from. And he's about to prove them completely wrong. I think that's what's going on here. Here he enlightens them. I've not come of my own accord. My starting point, folks, he's saying, is not Nazareth or even Bethlehem, but eternity past with my father. He's telling them this. I didn't come up with this mission on my own. And then he goes further and he says, he who sent me is true and in him you do not know. Now, let me take a look at that first part. He who sent me is true. What does he mean by that? I think what he's saying is that God really is the one who sent me. He really is. I'm not lying here. He's true. But then the second half of that, and he says, him you do not know. Now, we've all been in class before. Some of us have favorite teachers or teachers that we didn't like. And it's kind of hard to be called out when a teacher looks at you and you go, you don't know what you're talking about. When Jesus says this to the Jews, though, this is especially poignant You see, this attacks their Jewish pride. They've been told their whole lives and generations back, of all nations, they were the ones who really knew God. They really knew God. And Jesus looks at them and says, no, you don't. You see, the Jewish thought was this. God made himself known to them through the Old Testament law. And yet Christ has clearly insisted that the law was given to them as a way to point to who the Messiah would be. John 5, 46, Jesus says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So if you're reading the Old Testament as an Old Testament Jew, you're not reading it Christianly. You should be looking for pictures of the Messiah. And Jesus says, that was written ultimately about me. So here's what's going on if you're kind of trying to figure this out. They're rejecting Christ. And what Christ is saying to them is, by you rejecting me, you actually don't know the Bible, which is their Old Testament. And that goes further. You don't actually know the God who wrote the Bible. So it's like Christ is looking at them and saying, no wonder y'all don't know me. You don't know my dad. It's no wonder. But he says, but I know him. How does he know the Father? He tells him in verse 29, I come from him and he sent me. So he's saying two things to these Jerusalemites. Number one, he's saying, I come from him. I'm eternally begotten. I'm not from this earth, but from heaven. I have preexistence that goes back into eternity. And secondly, he's saying, he sent me. I'm on a divine mission here, folks. Yes, I'm from Nazareth. He didn't disown his city that he had grown up in, but he's also saying, I'm from the Father. He could have quoted Colossians 1, 16 and 17 before it had been written by the hand of Paul and the Holy Spirit, where he says, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, that's so fascinating when you think about Christmas time that Jesus as a uh, zygote, as a a, um, uh, baby in here, uh, what's the other term they use? 
fetus, embryo, it's a baby. But different stages, they call them different things. And so his point is that even in the smallest point he was physically, he was still holding the universe together. It's incredible. But I want us to focus for us, church, for just a moment on know him. Do you know him? Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, it says this, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Let me tell you this, when you become a believer, when God um, saves you, when you're born from above, and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you know God, period. You know him, that's your justification, that you have become a believer. And yet, at the same time, could you also say that even though as a believer I know God, I am still, what? Getting to know him, knowing him. And then in eternity future, we will always be knowing him more and more and more. Philippians 3.10, even Paul the apostle can say this when he talks about Jesus Christ, that I may know him. That's, so for Paul, this is not something that has happened yet, but isn't he a believer? Yes, he's a believer, but he's still in the process of knowing God, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is a good phrase, folks, for you to know, for those uh, theologians in here. And who am I looking at? Everyone, because we are all theologians. We're studying God. Uh, It's that phrase, already, not yet. It's helpful terminology when it comes to topics of this nature. Do I already know God? Yes. And yet there's another sense of not yet. Are there any other doctrines like that in Scripture? How much time do we have? Uh, Yeah, how about the kingdom of God? In Matthew 12, Jesus says, if I have healed, or rather, if I have cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Accurate? Yes, Jesus said it. It's accurate. And yet, there's another sense that we are part of the kingdom of God presently. And then there's another sense that we are waiting for the kingdom of God to come. And another one, how about holiness? Wait a second, Jeff, you're taking this too far. Are you saying I'm presently holy and yet at the same time I'm becoming holy and one day I will be holy in heaven? Yeah. Yeah, we see in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are present tense a holy nation a people belonging to God. We are saints, we are holy ones. And yet there's this other sense of holiness in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of God and of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Already, not yet. Which one do you embrace? Both, to be a good theologian. Yes, definitely. So just to be clear, you are righteous in the sight of God right now. I, do, I want to be very clear here. By the blood of Christ, when God looks upon you, he looks through the uh, blood-stained glass of his, of his son. And you are righteous in God's sight. And yet there's another sense that even though you've got the new heart, you've also got the residue of the flesh about you. And God is busy chipping away all that doesn't look like his son in your lives. That's why this life hurts so bad. Continuing on. Now they want to arrest him. Take a look. Verse 30 and 31. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Now, when it says they were seeking to arrest him, there's differing opinions. Who is the third person uh, pronoun there? They. They. I think it's the Jerusalemites. I think the people are ready to hand over Jesus to the the Sanhedrin. What I'm making a point is that I don't think the people are any better than the leaders. 
And the people are like, wait, you're not gonna tell us that we don't know God. And they're, they're wanting to arrest him. But how are they not able to arrest him? No one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So we would put it like this. They could not arrest him because his hour had not yet come. God prevents it from happening. And that's important for us to see in our daily lives as well. A.W. Pink, he notes the restraining hand of God on his enemies. Listen to this. They could no more arrest Christ than they could stop the sun from shining. Not a hair of our heads can be touched without his permission. Blessed be God, it is our privilege to be assured that the hand of death cannot strike us down before God's predestined hour arrives for us to go hence. The enemy may strike us, he may, and he may be permitted to strike our bodies, but shorten our lives, he cannot any more than he could Job's. You know, when you take walks in the morning or in the evening, sometimes you see animals on the side of the road, uh, died, got hit by a car. Whenever I see a bird, I stop. And I would encourage you to do the same. Matthew 10, 29, Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And you're worth more than many sparrows. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So will you, why would you stop at a bird? Because you remind yourself as you look down at that bird, the only reason why he's not flying around, it was not the will of God. God is in charge. And if he's in charge of sparrows or even birds, is he not in charge of you? Folks, Psalm 31, 15, our times are in his hand. You cannot stop the hand of God. I'm not saying devil may care. Y'all go out and jump off as many buildings on bungee cords as you'd like. It's kind of fallen away these days. They do other things that are more dangerous. No, but Acts 13, 36 is true. When David had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep. When you are done serving the purpose of God in your own generation, the Lord will lay you down and he will take you up and you cannot thwart the hand of God. And what do you do with that? Does that freak you out? Nah. You praise his name for it. Why? Because in your little American minds, like mine, we think somehow that we are in charge of our lives. And God has to remind us from time to times that our times are in his hand. So they're not gonna touch Christ. They can't. It's impossible. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. So now this is serious. They actually did not want to arrest him then, but they're realizing that something is going on. It's called the situation is out of hand and people are starting to believe. And remember in verse 12 and 13, no one was supposed to talk about Jesus, but now they're talking about him and now they're believing, it seems. The chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers. So the chief priests and Pharisees are both a combination. They're in a group called the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council. It's not written about in the Old Testament, but they came up with it after um, they had, uh, the Jews had been shipped off to Babylon. Uh, who, are, uh, who are these? Why would they talk about chief priest? If you read your Old Testament, do you read the plural? High priests, chief priests? No, you don't. No, you don't. Um, you see, it's interesting. The Old Testament law only allowed for one high priest or chief priest. That would be Aaron, the brother of Moses, and then finally his son, Eleazar. Uh, and it had to be in that line of priesthood. You could only had one at a time. So why are there several of them here, perhaps? Well, the Romans, let's not forget, the Romans owned Israel, and they would depose a high priest they didn't like, and they replaced him with another. Later on in John, we'll see that, where Jesus reports to 
uh, Annas and he also reports to Caiaphas. They're both high priests. What happened there? Uh, Annas got deposed for his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And so now they're both chief priests. But according to the law, there was only one. It really was a picture of the one high priest to come, Jesus Christ. So they're trying to arrest him quietly. They hate Jesus. They're afraid of the people. They don't want an uproar. And it seems perhaps they sent a a group of Levites. They had the Levites served as the temple police, and they've sent him to go get Jesus. Verse 33 through 36, Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. Well, let's kind of take this apart. Verse 33 He says, I will be with you a little longer and then I'm going to him who sent me. You see this in Jesus' life over and over again, something that we really should replicate. He had such a trust in his God. He had such a trust in his father that, hey, when it's his time, it's his time. And when I go, I go. And I just, I think, man, think about this like this, folks. If he trusted his father that much, And he was the one who knew the Father better than any of us will ever know the Father. Think how well he trusts him. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna be much more likely to trust a person who's been there before me. Jesus has been there before us by eternity past. He can be trusted when he says, I'm going to the Father. What he's saying, though, is more than that. He's saying time is running out here, folks. Time is running out for my work to be finished, and time is running out for y'all to believe. He says, you will seek me, and you will not find me. Why would they be seeking him in the future? Automatically, your minds are going to this. Well, of course they're going to seek him because they're going to kill him. No, they will find him, and they will kill him, but that's not what Jesus is referring to here because he says, you won't find me. What does he mean by that? I think what he means by that is this. You're gonna seek me out for salvation. Or at least they're gonna seek salvation. And he won't be there. He says, where I am, you cannot come. Well, what's he talking about? He's going to heaven. And here's the reason why you can't go to heaven. You must be born again. You must be born from above and you are seeking salvation and you're not gonna find me. Does Jesus ever say something so ominous in the other gospels? Yeah, he does. Listen to this. John 8, 21, we'll be there soon. He says, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Luke 13, 24 He tells them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. As one of the commentators states, it is not Jesus whom they will destroy when they remove him, but themselves. It's like Jesus is looking at them and saying, stop killing yourselves. What are you doing? The time is running out. Where does this man intend to go, they say, that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? First off, the way this is written in the Greek, it's it's saying the essence is this. He won't do this, will he? The answer is, of course he won't. Of course he won't do this. That's kind of the gist here. Well, what is he talking about when he says the dispersion? Dispersion, it was basically the Jews were dispersed around the globe at a particular time. In 722, it happened when the Assyrians attacked the northern kingdom, Israel, and sent the Jews all over Asia. And then in 586, the Babylonians did that with, the, with Judah, and they would send uh, the Judahites all over the globe. Eventually, all of them, you just shortened the name Judah, and you began to call them Jews, and they're all over 
Asia, Europe, North Africa. And you think that ended thousands of years ago? No, it actually didn't. Till just a few years ago, the highest number of Jews in the world lived in what place? New York City. New York City has been the center of Jewry in the world for a long time. Tel Aviv has now passed them up for the largest number of Jews. But they were all over the world. And so that's what they're saying. Who's this guy gonna go to? Is he gonna go teach and even teach among the Greeks? Well, what does he mean by the Greeks? Well, the Jews called anyone who lived beyond the sea, the Sea of the Mediterranean Greeks, uh, so that's why you see in Romans 1.16 that we're supposed to preach the, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And some of y'all, your translations say to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That's a very good rendition because the Jews refer to anybody living outside of where they live. They're, they're the Greeks. They're the Gentiles. Think same terminology. So what's interesting here, they say that's just too fantastic. He wouldn't do that. And you know what's so interesting here? They are unconsciously prophesying and they don't even know it. Caiaphas, the high priest, predicted that Christ's death would save the nation in John eleven forty nine 49 and 50. What he meant is they will, he will save the nation from being destroyed by the Romans. But he actually prophesies and he, he's very accurate. Jesus will die for the nation, amen. These people are doing the same things. They're unconsciously prophesying. What F.F. F. Bruce says is this, uh, he's the commentator. He says, little did the speakers know that while Jesus was not, would not go in person among the Greeks, his followers would be numbered in the tens of thousands in the Greek lands in a few years' time. And aren't y'all glad for that? Anybody who's got a background from Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, the Americas, anybody in here? Oh, you're, you're all from Antarctica. Is that what it is? You don't raise your hand? No. He went to our peoples. The disciples went to our folks. And eventually, look, we're on the other side of the globe, in some sense, to the ends of the earth in Texas. Man, we, the work's not done, just to be clear. What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? What does he mean by that? Well, they didn't understand that he was referring to his departure out of this world and that he would be gone. And so, to put it like this, they don't know what he's talking about. And Jesus is actually peppering all of his speech with warnings. You're gonna seek me, you won't find me, believe, and they're not going to. And my encouragement to you today for, for anybody that is not yet in Christ, and really there's some applications here for believers as well, is don't be like the Mexican Tetra. You can quote me on that. And you go, who or what is the Mexican Tetra? Mexican Tetra is also known as the Mexican blind cave fish. They're native to the lower Rio Grande in Texas, and further down into Mexico. We're not sure about these fish because these fish may be born blind or they are born with eyes that work, but they later cloud over and even shrink because there's no light in the dark caves that they live and eyesight is not necessary. That phrase came from the Denver Zoo. I just got so intrigued by this the other day. It says, their eyes cloud over and shrink. Their eyes cloud over and shrink. Is it possible for a true believer for his eyes to cloud over and shrink? We'll talk in a moment, but let me take, talk to unbelievers for a moment. Hebrews 12, the author warns the church not to be like Esau, who did not seek the Lord. He was unholy, it says. He was sexually immoral. He even sold his birthright for a single meal. And so Hebrews 12, 17, the author says, you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Calvin puts it this way. He's got a good quote. He says, they would desire that God should aid them 
and should be their redeemer, but by impenitence and hardness of heart, they obstruct their path. We have a very striking example in Esau, who on account of having lost his birthright, not only is oppressed with grief, but groans and gnashes his teeth and breaks out into furious indignation. But yet so far is he from the right way of seeking the blessing that at the very time when he is seeking it, he renders himself more unworthy of it. And let me put that in layman's language a little bit. Do you remember the story? Genesis 27, some of you do. Esau had already sold his birthright for a cup of Jacob's chili. It's actually, it's, he just said red stuff. Give me some of that red stuff. Um, he just, he doesn't care about his birthright. He did, it said the Bible said he despised his birthright. Later, as his father Isaac is seemingly dying, Esau wants the blessing, but Jacob tricks his dad into giving him the blessing instead. And to be very clear, the blessing of God was already going to be in Jacob's possession. Rebecca knew the prophecy, the older will serve the younger from the time the boys were in her womb. And I am certain that Isaac knew it as well. But what did Isaac consider? That tasty meat that Esau would hunt and cook for him. So Esau goes hunting, cooks the meal, brings it to his dad, and finds out he will not receive the blessing. Isaac has been tricked by Jacob. Esau's angry. He weeps loudly over the situation. Yet is Esau repentant? Do you get that picture? If you get that picture, then you haven't read the text. Is he repentant about selling his birthright, despising it, his unholy living, his sexual immorality, about his refusing to follow the Lord? No way. The text even reveals in Genesis 27, 41, Esau tells himself that after his dad has died, and I quote, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Then I'm going to murder my own brother. What happened, Esau? What happened? You were raised in the same house? Perhaps his eyes, his eyes clouded over and shrunk. He's living in darkness, yet he still wants the blessing. To be clear, an unbeliever doesn't clean up his life and be perfect and then come to Christ. No, you come to Christ today. Christ cleans you up. Yet there is a turning from sin and a turning to Christ Isaiah 55, 6 puts it this way, seek the Lord while he may be found. If you hear my voice today and you are not yet in Christ, you have not yet trusted him, your life is dying even at this moment and you don't know when the Lord will snatch you home, but it's not gonna be the home you wanna go to. If you're a believer today, there's strong applications here to you as well. The spirit can give you what he will, but I would point out this, God has birthed you with a new heart. You have the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus also warns his disciples in Matthew 24, 4, see that no one leads you astray. Is it possible for a believer to be led astray? Is it possible for a believer's eyes to become clouded over and shrink? Yes, of course. We've been given a new heart we don't lose our salvation, but can we lose our witness by our actions, our thoughts? I just finished reading a new biography about W.A. Criswell. Um, some of you don't know his name, but Criswell was the man, if you will, in 20th century evangelicalism. He pastored the largest Southern Baptist church in the world. Um, he did verse-by-verse verse exposition, which is what most Baptists didn't do at all. So you gotta give the guy some credit. Um, he impacted many people. Uh, I think he was a godly man. And yet, did he have regrets? Yes. Uh, O.S. Hawkins wrote the book on him, and Hawkins was like a son to him, and he wrote a couple of things about Criswell that would make your mouth drop open, and I'll tell them to you because I think it's important that we don't whitewash the past or we don't castigate somebody for their past either. Number one, you may not know this, Criswell was an early a proponent of segregation. Um, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you go, 
How could he make divisions between the body of Christ due to different colors? How evil is that? I agree. But I would say also you need to take a look in the mirror if you don't think that somehow you, your thinking, your actions might be wrong. Yeah, later, Criswell recounted, recanted of that, and he said, I don't think that segregation could have ever been or was at any time intelligently, seriously supported by the Bible. He's right, but early on, he was wrong. Uh, something that might be just as shocking, perhaps more so, in 1973, legalization of abortion in America, and they questioned Criswell about it And he said this, and here's a quote, I've always felt that it was only after a child was born and had a life separate from its mother that it became an individual person. And that it has always, therefore, seemed to me that what is best for the mother and for the future should be allowed. That's shocking. Now, be careful, because some of you I can even see now, you're reaching down underneath your chair for a rock to throw you better beware because you people scare me because you're not aware of your own sin. What does that text say? And that's saying, ultimately, you got it right. He he was pro-choice. He was pro-abortion at the time. Many pastors at that time were true evangelicals. Yeah, true evangelicals. Chris, one other pastor, soon repented of this unbiblical view, and he preached against abortion many times afterwards. And yet, why? Why did they repent of it? Because they recognized that abortion is in reality child sacrifice. Sacrificing the baby for the desires of the mother or father or both or other reasons. And it's important to note, even at this time, the Lord saves even those who have committed those sins, of course. Lastly, how could Criswell and other evangelical pastors believe in segregation? An abortion? How's that even possible? And I would say it's because the Bible's very clear. Because true believers can be led astray. Not losing their salvation, but certainly their witness if they're not careful. You can too. That's why you have Haggai in the Old Testament. He's writing about Jews that have returned from Babylon and were living in paneled houses failing to obey the explicit command of God to rebuild the house of the Lord. And Haggai says this phrase, and we'll close with this phrase. Haggai 1.5, he just says this. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Grace Church of Ovilla, whoever you are, if you are in Christ, you need to, you need to be in the word. You need to be where that your eyes can start to close if you're not spending time in the word, in prayer, fellowshipping with other believers, being okay with being confronted, even if it wasn't done in love, and say, okay, Lord, show me. Consider my ways. I wanna be like the son. I wanna be like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, uh, this is, hits me hard because so many times I have uh, not done this and I'm certain there's times I don't do it now, maybe many times. And so we pray that you would help the believers in here, Lord, that we would be open, um, that we would not take opportunity to hurt our fellow brethren, but if there are times that we should confront and love because we realize that um, we have a new heart, but Lord, we still got a lot of sin that um, we hold on to, that we cherish. And so help us, Lord, with that. And I pray for any unbeliever in here who's not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior. Would you grant them salvation now? Would you help them to repent and believe and hand their sins over to you? Because that's the only thing, really, they're bringing to the cross. In your son's name we pray it, amen.